present to you now as a follow-up to that, and uh, maybe as a door to open up some of the questions you may have. Because the first thing um, that, you, that is a shock for a lot of people is um, the discussion that we have about people who cross the Atlantic, Muslims, in America before Columbus. And this, for many people, um, goes against some of the ingrained information uh, that we have been taught in the, the, the school system. And the purpose of um, having an Islamic History Month um, is to be able to fill in the gaps, to give you some of the information that you would not normally get uh, in the school system. I myself asked this question. Very simple way. Because uh, I was told Christopher Columbus discovered America in 1492. And I'm sure most of you learned this in school. I went to China, Hong Kong, and I asked the people who discovered America. They said Christopher Columbus. And I went to, to, to Nairobi, Kenya. They said, you know, Columbus. I said, when? They said 1492. But then as a young person, I asked about the picture of Columbus. Right? Look at the picture here, uh, and you will see people are in the picture. So my question as a young child was, how can you discover a place if the people are already there? You understand this? I went to uh, Oshawa. And then I said, uh, Abdullah Hashim discovered Oshawa in 2013. Because the first time I went there. You see, you would be denying the heritage of the people who already have been there. So that statement is a wrong statement. But this was uh, put written in all languages. That statement was written. And that statement is so important. It is one of the most important historical statements after uh, uh, Jesus Christ, Isa alayhi salam, that's how they say like BC and AD. So it is Christ, right before Christ and after. 1492 is a cutoff point for history as well. But the question is, the people are already there. And Columbus, we find out now, I got the chance to read his writings. And I found that Columbus, in his writings, knew about people going across the, the Atlantic before him. He also, when he got there, he couldn't properly describe where he was. So he went back to Spain. And they said, who are these people that you brought on the boat? He said, Indians. But he wasn't an Indian. He bumped into America on his way to India, right? That's not Indian. He also carried on his boat people who could speak Arabic. They were Muslims who had hidden their identity. And tomorrow, inshallah, when we look at Granada and Al-Andalus, I'm going to show you about these people called Moresco. So um, uh, these people could speak Arabic, and they were with Columbus. So Columbus thought he would meet the great Khan of India, and Arabic is one of the international languages at the time. So he thought he actually landed in India, and he couldn't describe where he had been. So the reality was there were over 75 million people living in the Americas. This was one of the most important uh, parts of the world on the planet. There are products that you eat normally. Do you know that uh, corn originated here? Tomatoes, potatoes, they all originate in the Americas. Potatoes are not Irish. Right? The Irish used the potatoes to survive the famine, but potatoes came from here. And you see a list of over a hundred products, which are normal foods that everybody eats all over the world that actually started here. 75 million people were living all over North America, Central America, Caribbean, South America, speaking over a thousand different languages. Some of them had pyramids in Mexico. Great civilization. So the reality is, what we're doing now is deconstructing history, taking it apart and putting it back together. And that is part of our, our look tonight in trying to understand this issue of uh, Muslims and Islamic heritage. If I had my way, and we were starting to um, get some writing in um, when it was a liberal government before I was working with the Toronto Board of Education, 
And uh, we, um, we're actually about to put into the book Christopher Columbus was discovered in 1492. You understand the difference in the two? He was discovered because he was actually lost. Now, how can you get across? And Muslims, how can you Muslims get across? Because most people, when they hear the word Islam or Muslim, they do not associate it with science, right? They don't associate it with education. Today, unfortunately, it is normally associated with violence, which is the complete opposite of the word Islam itself, coming from Salam, which means peace. Reality was, in this time, from the 7th to the 16th century, what is called the Dark Ages of Europe, this was the Golden Age of Islam. And Muslims were actually leading the world in science and technology. You saw some of it in the exhibition downstairs. If you get a chance to go into the details, uh, you, can, you can follow it up at the website. And it's very interesting to understand the levels that Muslims have reached. This was not done through magic. It was not uh, jinns. They have a program now playing downtown. It's Aladdin, right? That's when they're giving us some publicity now. It's Aladdin and the lamp. Okay, flying on his carpet, open sesame, right? Um, in reality, it was not open sesame and rubbing a lamp for the genie or the jinni uh, to come and to give you science. Muslims naturally are geared towards science. Because every time we pray, we need direction. So we need to know the qibla, right? So therefore, every Muslim, in a sense, is a scientist. Because we, we want to know our, our relationship to the stars, where we are on the planet, in order to make our prayers five times a day. So it was a natural thing for Muslims to be involved in astronomy, in geography, in traveling the pilgrimage to Mecca. You want to go to Mecca from all over the world. So they started to make uh, travel uh, guides. The same way, if you want to take a, a journey across Canada, and you want to go to Alberta and see the beautiful mountains, and then go all the way to Vancouver, you go to the uh, CAA. Right? And the CAA, Canadian Automobile Association, they'll give you a map. And they'll mark on the map which highway to take. So similarly, um, Muslims um, uh, made books similar to that. So you could travel uh, from the mountains high in Nepal, or if you were going from Indonesia on the ocean, crossing the des Sahara Desert. So these books were made. And, uh, they made amazing achievements. The first encyclopedia. You know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, before computers, and it's not a long time ago, right? Many of us, I say, I was born in BC. Right, they say, BC, you must be really old. No, before computers. <coughs> right, but that's not long ago, that's in the 90s, right? Computers came in in the 90s. Or you could say, I was born in BFB, before Facebook. We used to, instead of Googling it, today you want some information, they Google it, right? Or they go to the Wikipedia. We used to go to the almanac. Encyclopedias and almanac. The word almanac is an Arabic word, almanac. It's an Arabic word. Okay, and it was originally made by Muslims in order to uh, bring a lot of uh, information for travelers and those who are going to new uh, environments. And so, uh, in this journey, the scientists, in a practical sense, needed to, to master direction. And so they, de they developed the magnetic needle, the true compass, the sextant, the quadrant, astrolabe, as you saw downstairs, even a, a, a woman by the name of astrolabe, right? This is actually Muslims who did this. And that's what the books used to look like. You have Arabic, the same way we're using English letters, but then you have scientific information uh, that is there as well. And you'll find it in medicine, you'll find it in so many different areas. Uh, what is important to us, however, is the areas of navigation, astronomy, geography. It is just part of the achievements of Muslims. But in this area, for instance, these are, 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 are actual um, are quadrants, are, a compass on the right, it's actually a huge thing. Um, I met the person, I, I visited the country of Oman, a place called Masqat. 
and there in Oman, the Omanis, because they travel on the ocean so much, they pass on as a heritage uh, these compasses and quadrants and sextants that they spend a lot of their life on the sea. And so this was an inheritance passed down. The, the, the compass is like this size. And so um, uh, these same astrolabes and uh, quadrants and, and sextants, these were used um, by Columbus, Da Gama, Magellan, all the Portuguese and Spanish uh, uh, conquerors who went out. In, 18, in 830 AD, again, to give you an idea of the level of achievement, one of the great caliphs of the Abbasid period in Baghdad, he commissioned um, uh, his, his uh, scientist, al Farghani. They had a place called Beit al-Hikmah. And they used to bring in people of all religions to come in to discuss science. Don't have to be Muslim. It's like a think tank. And they would discuss all of the different issues. So say, for instance, they want to study zero, and they had somebody from India, a Hindu man would come, and say, no, we had zero a long time ago. An Egyptian would come and say, we had zero from back in 3000 BC, in the temple of Saqqara, right? In the huge pyramid, you'll see zero, right angle. So they discuss it, and then they record it in Arabic, right? That's how Muslims assimilated information. International knowledge was assimilated. One of the scholars, al Farghani, he looked at the Ptolemy's writings, the Greek uh, astronomer, and he took it from theoretical astronomy to practical astronomy. And his book was so important, it was being used for centuries, uh, for 700 years in Europe and much of the world. This was the main book of astronomy, al Farghani's book. So you find achievements like this. Now in the writings, I went through a series of the writings, and I found in the writings of Al Masudi, in a book called Muruj al Dahab, he talks about the journey of people from Spain or Portugal into the ocean, and they reached a place and came back. So they were discussing journeying across the Atlantic, and this is around 956. Okay. 999, Abu Bakr ibn Umar al-Qudsiyya, in his book as well. Al-Idrisi, in his famous book at the 11th century, he writes about the journey of a, of a group uh, that made it all the way to the Bahamas, and they came back. Al-Umari, his famous book, Masalik al-Abra, fi Mamalik al-Amsar. We're gonna discuss what he talked about. 1517, Piri Rais, a famous Turkish uh, cartographer, he presented maps to the Sultan, Selim the First. I'll sh I'm going to show you the map, right, which is an amazing find. Now this is what the maps would have looked like. And if you can adjust your eye, let me uh, turn the light down here so you can see it better. Now if you can adjust your eyes here, our maps are upside down, right? Actually, it was the right way. Because who decided that we're north and uh, the tip of Argentina or South Africa is south? Who decided that? Europeans. I lived in Cape Town for 10 years. And when I was in South Africa, right, I was, the sun was above me and the earth was below me. I was up. I wasn't hanging upside down. <laughs> you understand? It's how you orient yourself your orientation, okay? So the Muslim orientation, the civilizations came from the south and they went north, not from north to south. That's what they want you to think, that the southern countries are underdeveloped countries and the northern countries are developed countries, but it's actually the opposite way around. And that's the way the maps used to be made. And you can see on this map, he is talking about this land right here. It's called Arab Majhula. Unknown territory. That this is Masudi's map, 957. That's Masudi's map. I'm going to turn it around for you. Okay. Now let's look at it now. This is Africa here. This is, a, this is an old map, right? See the African continent here. See Arabia. You see India. This is Sri Lanka, right? 
his Indonesian islands, Russia going around, his, uh, he even had like um, Sweden and up here. Okay, here is Spain. He left out England, I think. He didn't have Britain at all. <laughs> <laughs> they were behind Hadrian's Wall. And so here's, look at, there's Italy there. You see the map? Now look at this continent here. That's Africa. Here it is. We call this Ardas Mashbula, unknown territory. This is the oldest map showing the Americas. It's 1967, right? And this is what you find. Also, look at this. This is the map of Piri Rais. You got to sort of adjust your eye. Okay, I don't know if they have Guyana in this. <laughs> Maybe Dutch Guyana, Suriname. Right? <laughs> I think it's Guyana's over there, right? But look at look at South America, right? See the see this is Brazil, right? See the map of Brazil? This is 1517. It's almost an exact map of today. How did they get a map in 1517? when Columbus only landed in 1492. You see that? So what Salim, what, what Piri Rais has done, he was putting together maps of people who had been going back and forth. He presented it to the Sultan. And this map is there in Istanbul now. The original maps that were presented. This is hard evidence. If you're a historian or a geographer, you have to present hard evidence, right? This is hard evidence people were coming long before Columbus. Columbus was actually very late. But they say, how can you get across? You people don't have the right technology. Okay, how can you make it across? These are currents. The currents take you right across like this. It's like a magnetic pull under the ocean. And it'll take you right across, and you can travel with the currents right into Brazil, or you take the higher currents, and it'll take you right into Barbados. It's right in. Turn left there, you can go to Guyana too. Just turn left. The currents will take you right in. But then they say, okay, the currents are there, but you people don't have boats. But this was the Arab Dao. And the Arab Dao, the Romani, they will had reached Japan long before the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. They were already in Japan. And their boats were all over the world. But just to prove it, a Norwegian scientist named Thor Heyerdahl. He, this is his boat. He took the boat rather first, and he went from uh, Morocco, uh, and he landed in Barbados. He took another one, the Kantiti, and he went across the Pacific Ocean as well. So he proved, because it was made by Africans using African materials. And he did it by himself. So he proved that people had the technology uh, to go across early in these times. This is the, the, the journey that um, Imam Johari was talking about. It's a very famous African ruler. You know this word, Mandingo man? You heard the word Mandingo man, Fula man? Okay, Mandingo, Mandinka is from the Mande group. They were a famous group. This leader here, whose name was Mansa Musa, there was a book that came out recently, and they were trying to find who are the richest people that ever lived in history. And they said, number one, the richest man who ever lived was Mansa Musa. How did they get that? It's because he had gold. And when he made pilgrimage to Mecca in 1324, he carried with him 72,000 people across the Sahara Desert. Can you imagine this? It's like a city moving. He carried 15,000 camels laden with gold. This is a map drawn by a European cartographer. That's probably not how he looked, right? But they had like his, his crown gold. He had gold at the side of his grapefruit. 15,000 camels of gold, right? They changed the economy of every country that they reached. This is Mansa Musa. His older brother, Abu Bakr, crossed into the Atlantic with 2,000 ships, and he never came back. Now look at the distance here. Look at the distance between here, right? That's uh, where Mali was, the coast, and Brazil. See that right there? That's not far. And the current will easily take you across. And those who live in Barbados, 
uh, which is the most uh, easterly island in the Caribbean. If, if they have a sandstorm in Mauritania, or there you, you, you feel it in Barbados. You get pieces of wood and things float across from West Africa. It lands on, 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 uh, on, on the seashore in Barbados. Okay. So uh, Abu Bakr went across. These are some of the uh, uh, artifacts, what they found, writings across the, 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 the Amazon River. And so they went up into uh, Peru, into Mexico, a person by the name of Leo Weiner. He's a Harvard University professor. He wrote a book called Africa and the Discovery of America. So he talked about the journey there. Now, this scholar named Alexander Van Wuttenau, he made this uh, display in Mexico City, and he found these terracotta, these figures, right? These heads are uh, long before Columbus in Mexico. <coughs> Look at the faces of early, some early Mexicans, not all Mexicans, right? But look at the faces, look at that. This one, you know he's a Muslim because number one, he has a turban on. See the turban and the hat, right? And then this scarification that was used by some tribes in West Africa, Mexicans don't do that. This is before Columbus, they found it in Mexico. Okay? Also this, in Mexico. So there's hundreds of these to show the presence of these early people who came into the region. The British called them black Caribs. That's what the British called them. They were, you could find them in St. Vincent and now in Belize. All along the coastline of Belize, Costa Rica, Honduras, Panama, there are people living there um, who they are, are so-called black Caribs. They are living there and they have their own language uh, and, they, and we have proof now that they were there actually before Columbus and the Spanish ran into them all over the region. So this is the first presence of, of African people, solid presence of African people in the region. Some of the African people who you're running across in the Caribbean did not come on slave ships. They were actually there before in the early time. But it is during this period of slavery that um, one estimate, you know, to be fair, around 15 to 30 percent overall um, of African people taken as prisoners of war or slaves to the Americas were Muslim. This is where these names are coming from, right? Because if you were a rebellious uh, slave, they call you a mandingo, right? That is the term that they use. The Senangambians, the Wolofs of uh, Senegal, very strong people. The Portuguese brought them over. In 1522, they made a, a revolution. They revolted in the Hispaniola. They later made rebellions in Puerto Rico and Panama as well. Okay, so this is early Caribbean history now. The first African, or the, or the next wave after the uh, explorers who came, these are some of the people now, um, because time is short. Um, these are some of the names and some of the people uh, who we are celebrating now to bring out to you as part of our heritage. Muhammad Kaaba, these are real names. It could be United States, it could be uh, Caribbean, Central America, South America, right? Muhammad Kaaba from Buka, he was from Guinea. He, st he studied to be a judge, he was captured at 20 and they deported him to Jamaica. Abu Bakr Siddiq from Guinea. Uh, sorry, he was a cleric from Timbuktu, right? The famous city of knowledge. He was captured and taken to Jamaica in 1834. Francois Macadel, you know Haiti, right? Haitian Revolution. Before Toussaint Louverture, the revolution, there were people making revolts on the plantations. One leader was named Macadel, and the other was named Bookman. These were Muslim leaders, they call them Marabou. They were Muslim scholars, and uh, uh, Louverture, Toussaint Louverture, organized the rebellion. Saleh Bilali, right, captured at 14. Bilali Muhammad, these are some of the names. Old Lizzie Gray. Now look what old Lizzie Gray said, right? She died in South Carolina, and they said to her, they forced her to accept Christianity. They said, tell us about Christianity. You know what she said? She said, Christ built the first church in Mecca 
and his grave was there. Now this is a resistance, right? He's resisting, right? You have to read through the words, right? What do you think she was saying? Christ, they said, tell us about Christ. She said he built the first church in Mecca, and his grave was there. Where was she actually talking about? Right, the prophet Muhammad was talking about where his grave is there. What city? It was Medina, actually. But they talk in, you know, they can't talk straight. They use the word Mecca, right? That's resistance, right? This is how we find the evidence. It comes out in the documents. Fatima Othibi, wife of Bilal <coughs> Muhammad, also very famous. These are actual pictures of her. We actually have documented pictures of the people captured. These are their writings in Arabic. They were writing Arabic all over the region now. The United States were finding them. We're finding documents in um, uh, on the islands, different islands, you know, amazing things. Okay, I went to the island of Bahamas, and I went to the, uh, uh, to the main uh, place in Nassau, the museum. And the archivist, I said, do you have anything in Arabic? And she said, no, but we have something in Ethiopian language. I said, let me see. And it was some old Arabic. It was Surah Al-Nas, Falak. She was seeking refuge from Shaitan, that's all, right? But she didn't know it was old Arabic, right? And then a document came, she showed me, and it said, on the island of Exuma, the majority of the inhabitants are followers of Mahomet. They use the word Mahomet. That's the Middle Age word for Muhammad, alayhi salatu salam. What they're saying on the island of Exuma, which is one of the big islands in, in the Bahamas, the majority of their people who lived on the island are Muslims. This is the type of information now coming to the surface. This is Abdurrahman. If any of you want to study about him, there's a book called Prince Among Slaves by Terry Alfred. You can also get a documentary, a docudrama about his life. Prince Among Slaves. Okay? That's Abdurrahman. You see the Arabic there? Those of you who read Arabic? It's Mubu Abdurrahman. See it? That's his writing. These are old documents. This is Mississippi. You never expect Arabic in Mississippi, right? That's in Mississippi. Now, look at this here. It said that this here, it said they tried to force him to be Christian. And the, they said that the person who was forcing him to convert, you know, he, he, he played along with them for a while and then returned with his Islam and eventually went home. But in this case, the man said, can you write the Lord's Prayer in Arabic? We know you write Arabic, right? So he's making fun of him, right? So write the Lord's Prayer in Arabic. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Right? Rabbuna alladhi fis sama. You have to write something like this, right? What did he write? This, this is resistance, right? He knew one day somebody's going to come along, right? who could read Arabic like we can now, the Lord's Prayer in Arabic, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, he wrote the Fatiha. But they couldn't read Arabic, right? You get what he did? They couldn't read Arabic to know what he was writing. But he knew one day somebody would come along, you know, and, and realize that this man was Muslim. This is uh, Yaro Mahmud, 70 years in slavery. 70 years. Umar bin Sayyid, he wrote his whole biography, autobiography in Arabic. He wrote his whole life in Arabic. He was a major scholar. His books are now on display in museums. These uh, Arabic writings are coming to the surface, uh, especially in Brazil. In Bahia section of Brazil, there was a major uprising there in Bahia in 1835, and the slaves were given, many of them were given boats and they returned to West Africa. But their writings are now coming to the surface now, Arabic writings. So these are some of the writings that are coming from Brazil and different parts of the Caribbean region uh, and the United States. And these are faces. These are the actual writings that are coming to the surface now. And it's, it's, it's very interesting studies to be done. So you look at this. On the right side is the letter of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that he had written to give to the king of Abyssinia, right? The Najashi, when they made the first hijrah migration. He wrote him a letter. That's on the right. 
On the letter left is a Brazilian Muslim. Okay, so this is cultural continuity. That's something which is being passed down from generation to generation. Okay? And what they left in their lifestyle, what they were famous for, there were three things that distinguished uh, the African Muslim um, slaves. One was Tawheed, right? The strict monotheism, oneness of God. Two, Tahara, purity of mind and body and spirit. And three, al-amru bil ma'ruf wa nahi al-munkar, calling to righteousness and forbidding evil and corruption. These are three qualities that they were known for. Unfortunately, because slavery separated families and they could not read Arabic, they could not pray, they were forced uh, out of their faith. Um, they lost it, but as you saw, um, it's coming back now. This is uh, another picture of Malcolm X. You usually see him with a nice suit and tie on, right? That's Malcolm X from here. And that is him near the end of his life. Okay, so I want to open up the floor for any uh, questions anybody may have uh, concerning uh, what we looked at today. Um, Outside of what you found, like, have you found any other like uh, historians or non-Muslim uh, scholars that have documented some of this stuff? Oh yes, now, especially um, in the slavery period, right? The Muslims in the slavery period, that's, that's accepted in all the universities. Okay. So you will go to um, Sylviana Jok, is a famous one, uh, Servants of Allah. There's one called Alan Austin. Uh, there's a whole list of them now. You can go to York University or any of them, and you'll see people writing about Muslims uh, in the slavery period. The one that they don't want to accept yet is before Columbus, because Columbus is the holy grail. They're upset now that they can't say he, he discovered America anymore. So are there any scholars like that are Muslim that are trying to do that? Yes, there was one scholar, a Guyanese actually. Uh -huh. uh, his name was Ivan Van Turpenhoff. And uh, he was at Rutgers University. And he wrote a book before they called, they came before Columbus, right? But that was so controversial. He told me himself, because I met him here in Toronto. Okay. And he said that after he wrote that book, that he was visited by the State Department and they said, you are now deported from the United States. <laughs> and the only reason why they let him stay, he and his guy and his wife, is that he had adopted an American child. So they let him stay. And he was a famous, well-known, he went to the uh, United States, I think it was the Congress. He made a, a special uh, delivery uh, to the Congress. It was in 1992. And they had 500 years, we call quincentenary celebrations of Columbus's voyage. He, he went there as a scholar, and you know, he proved to them. And then and he said, number one, it's an insult to do this, right? Because your native people are here. You know the football players, they have a team called Washington Redskins. How can you call your team Redskins? This is an insult, right? Right, so I'm saying, how can you say Columbus discovered America? When you had 75 million people living here, this is no longer acceptable for us, right? You know, our universities are open, our minds are open now, right? We have international communications. You gotta change your books, right? And so now they are changing the books now, slowly. Still, they have Columbus Day. It's a big holiday in America. Columbus is a really important person. If you break him down, that's the holy grail. You know, so they're a little reluctant about that, but they have accepted Muslims in the slavery period. Other questions? Our floor is open for any questions. Yes. What they did was they was looking for new lands and you know whatnot, and they became part of the society. They actually integrated into the society. So if you look in Panama, for instance, they have a group of people in Panama. It's one of the Panamanian people, and they're known to be you know dark-skinned people, you know whatever. It's part of their society, and they're not from the slaves. And you have people all along the coastlines and everything. So they integrated into society. But you know the unfortunate thing was the colonial period. Because when the Spanish conquistadores came, especially the Spanish, when they conquered Mexico, uh, the Aztecs, and then they conquered Peru, what they would do is they would kill the leaders and they would take every single book they could find and burn it. Every single written document. 
right? So they were wiping away the history of the past. Okay, but this now, the indigenous people now, the Mayan people in Mexico, and um, uh, the Garifuna, this is the black cat, they call themselves Garifuna. They're from Belize and Honduras. And many of the native groups now are now rising up and you know, showing you know, their contribution to history uh, as well. So they became part of the American society. But unfortunately, it was all consumed by the colonial period. When the colonial forces came, they enslaved everybody. Right? And then they developed new societies. Is there any, uh, like, uh, any African American comedy practicing in different parts of Islam uh, history from this Malcolm X? Or yes, Malcolm X is really part of a growth, it's an evolution. You know, and now Malcolm X started a group called uh, Muslim Mosque Incorporated in New York. So what, are, what are his, his form? Of his yeah, so this became regular. After, before he died, he went to Mecca and he made Hajj, Jazar, right? So he became, uh, you know, Sunni, Ahl Sunnah. He was praying and everything. He was regular Muslim, and he was teaching, you know, regular Islam. And he had a place called Muslim Mosque Incorporated. And from that mosque, when he got killed, a number of big movements came in New York City. So they're continuing the tradition, you know, of Malcolm, of Malcolm X. Right? But some of uh, Elijah Muhammad's followers, uh, Minister Farrakhan, Louis Farrakhan, and them, they have returned back to Elijah Muhammad's teaching. But Islam is now widespread, and everybody knows what the true Islam really is. Any other general questions? Or uh, I know this is about the Muslims in the Americas, uh, but a few years ago I met uh, Grand Chief Stuart Phillip of the Six Nations, and I was sharing actually some of what you've said in previous khutbas. Mm -hmm. And he told me that, uh, I don't remember exactly, but it was like 1,100 or 1,200, there were three Muslims from Andalusia that came here and they became part of what becomes the Six Nations. And I haven't seen it, but he told me that they still have a letter from those three Muslims, mm -hmm. and they became part of uh, their, like the, the Mohawk tribe here. Mm -hmm. So is there uh, anything that you could talk about the Muslims that here? Would be, that would be interesting to, you know, to see that information. What I read across, there's a book by James Lowen, The Lies My Teacher, my teacher Told Me. James Lowen is his name. He's a big historian in the University of Vermont. And what he showed was that the Mi'kmaq, the Mi'kmaq nation, this, they are the first nation, they're in Newfoundland, right? So when, 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 Cabot <coughs> landed, when Cabot landed in Newfoundland, in that area there, the Mi'kmaq was the first native people to meet the Europeans. And in the writings of the Mi'kmaq, in this book, they talk about Niskam. And Niskem is the great spirit, the creator. And when you read the descriptions of Niskem, it's like what we call Asma, Asma al Husna, the 99 names of Allah. So these are, is, these are straight, Tawhidic uh, descriptions of God. So they believed in one God, clearly, the Mi'kmaq. And the Cherokee, Cherokee also, uh, a person named Robert Crane, who was part Cherokee, he got some of their uh, writings of the teachings of the elders. And the Cherokees used to face east, and they used to make a prayer. Some write, some of them even said, Ya Allah, before they started to pray. The Cherokees. So there's certain groups where it's coming up now of the native groups. Um, but unfortunately, because many of the groups had oral tradition, they didn't write it down. And because of the colonial period, you know, and whatnot, the destruction of the, you know, of, of, of the families, and, you know, the forced uh, missionary schools. Uh, much of that history is lost. But it, but it is being pieced together now. <coughs> Just now, the exchange is with the people in Canada, when I learned history, it's the two founding nations, yes. French and British. Now the newcomer book of Canada, the three founding nations, came out this year by the Harper government, and it included native people. So when the Métis, Louis Riel, or even their view, the where the history of the native people are yet to be told fluently. For example, there was a Guyanese called James Douglas. He's the father of British Columbia, married to the Inuit people. Their first Manchester and other things in Edmonton and the Hudson Bay. So I'm sure these native people, what you said, will come out more. You will see that as the, as, as the three founding nations of this one catch up to the other two. You will see the next generation will change a lot. 
That's right, because now we're, we're learning a lot of things. We're, we're getting into language. And even the word Canada itself, right? People say, well, what is, where did Canada come from? Is it, is it a city in Britain or France? Is it just uh, ginger ale? Like, no, it's Canada. Canada is Iroquois, the Iroquois nation, one of the First Nations people. What does it mean in Iroquois language? Anybody know? The village? Right, it means a big village, Canada. So that's what you're living in now, a big village, right? I mean, second biggest village in the world, right? In terms right. of land space, right? Right next door to Morningside and Prince here, in the 17th century, is a big graveyard of the Iroquois nation. Mm. And even Central Island, we used to go in the 1700s to relax. So there is on whole that the native people, especially Ontario, the Iroquois, they will come up more as the tribe of the United Nations to balance that. So this is the kind of study that we're, we're looking for now. It's what we used to call not his story, you know the word history? His story, it's our story. You get it? Not his story. We want everybody's story, right? Tell everybody's story. And then you really have the right history. Uh, in terms of like the real Canadian Definitely, definitely. Yeah, James Lowen, in his book, Lies My Teacher Told Me, uh -huh. also a person called Howard Zinn. Howard Zinn, he has done some, that's Z-I-N-N. -N. Okay. He has books, on, he's rewritten American history and brought a lot of the true okay. information. They were actually given information. They were considered, they considered this land, you know, by their rulers, they considered the land to be empty land. Okay. That nobody actually lived in it because they were not converted, right? So they could do whatever they wanted to. They considered it empty land. And, and by any means necessary, you need to take this land. That's, this is what they were told. And this is not to blame everybody who came across either, right? Because there were many Europeans who came across who were just farmers and, you know, mostly the poorer people, right? But the aristocrats and the ones who were, that wanted the land, they used their own people. In America, they even tried to make the poor Europeans slaves. Before they got African, they tried to make their own people slaves, but they refused. And they tried to make the Indians slaves. But the Indians said, no, I'm not, I'm not your slave. He would just sit down and not work. And as soon as he gets away, he just runs in the bush. And you can't catch him, that's his territory, right? That's why they went to Africa. You see, so, so it's not every European you know, who was wrong in that. 90% of the Europeans were actually slaves. They were called serfs. And they worked for the aristocrats. So this is part of our heritage uh, program that we're bringing to you. We also have available today, because we're talking about heritage now, you need to have in your houses now heritage. Right? It's not just the food that we eat, right? We have a lot of heritage in our food. Right? You get your shawarma, your pool, your demnis, your roti, you know, your biryani. That's heritage, right? Who made biryani? Does anybody know? Where is biryani first eaten? No, it was Mughals, right? It was the Mughals who first put biryani together, right? So that's heritage. When you're eating biryani, right, you got to know your roots, right? I looked up the other day, it was Persian. They said Persian. Yeah. I, I, I read it was the Mughals. Maybe there's, maybe there's different versions of biryani, right? <laughs> but in any event, this is roots, right? So everybody should, and, and your walls on your house should reflect your roots. You don't have a picture of uh, Elvis Presley or Lady Gaga or something on your wall, <laughs> right? Have some nice Islamic calligraphy or, or drawings. And what I have done, I've traveled to 61 countries, you know, studying Islam. And I, I recorded a lot of pictures. And uh, it was discovered you know, by, uh, by, by my daughter, actually, who, who has an eye for things, that some these pictures are actually um, you know, something that should be preserved. So what we have done, we've made a collection of these pictures. And these pictures have now reached the level of being um, you know, put in you know, art displays. Right? So I brought some of them here to you, you know, so you can actually see the collection. That's what you need to do with your pictures, right? You take some beautiful pictures, you know, places when you travel, 
right? Not just, you know, put these things together in catalogs, right? Frame these things, right? We should have, in, the, in our clothing is our history. In, in the sofa, in your, in your rugs in your house. These rugs are really important. Does anybody here have a Persian carpet or uh, Afghan carpet? Anybody have Afghan carpet? Persian, Pakistani carpet, Turkish. You have to ask yourself, where'd your carpet come from? Do you know where your carpet come from? Do you know what the design is on the carpet? These designs are significant. And somebody who comes from Afghanistan, they will tell you which section it came from. And they can tell you about the history of your carpet, right? That used to be important to us, not just flying around with a lever, right? <laughs> right? That's part of our heritage, right? Right? Tomorrow, inshallah, I want, I want to show you the history of Islam in North Africa, in Al Maghrib, Tunisia, Morocco, and Spain, Al Andalus. And we want to show you some amazing things from Al Andalus. Uh, tomorrow, inshallah, that will be our discussion. That will be at the same time uh, as this one. Uh, any other final questions uh, anybody has? So we're going to give you a chance to look at uh, the display here. We have some postcards as well. Uh, and uh, for those of you who are you know, interested in more mundane information, I have my book here, Holiday Myths. You know Halloween? It's coming, right? So if you want to know the truth about Halloween and what's the Islamic religion, there's a book over there, right? You can learn how to teach your kids not Halloween, right? You know, we said, you know, don't be involved at all. Okay? So we leave you with this and have a safe journey home. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Those of you who stay around a little bit later, the youth, uh, you're going to have pizza? There's going to be some pizza a little bit later if any of you are hungry, inshallah. We'll see you tomorrow.